To the Wellesley College Choir, thank you. What an inspiring and uplifting way to start this very special ceremony. President Johnson, distinguished alumni, students, faculty, staff, and guests, good afternoon. I am Laura Wood Cantifer, class of 1984, and I am president of the Wellesley College Alumni Association. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to the 53rd Alumni Achievement Award Ceremony, our first in-person ceremony in three years. <laughs> I will begin by reading the Wellesley College land acknowledgement. We acknowledge that Wellesley College is built on ancestral and traditional land of the Massachusetts people. We also recognize that the United States' removal, termination, and assimilation policies and practices resulted in the forced settlement of indigenous lands and the attempted erasure of indigenous cultures and languages. We further acknowledge the oppression injustices and discrimination that indigenous people have endured and that there is much work to be done on the important journey to reconciliation. We commit to strengthen our understanding of the history and contemporary lives of indigenous peoples and to steward this land. We further recognize the many indigenous people living here today, including the Massachusetts Wampanoag and Nipmuc nations who have rich ancestral histories in Wellesley and its surrounding communities. Today, their descendants remind us that they are still here where they maintain a vital and visible presence. We honor and respect the enduring relationship between these peoples and this land, as well as the strength of indigenous culture and knowledge the continued existence of tribal sovereignty, and the principle of tribal self-determination. The Alumni Achievement Award was established by the Wellesley College Alumni Association to recognize the outstanding accomplishments of Wellesley graduates, and the award remains the highest honor that Wellesley bestows. Over the last 53 years, this award has been earned by scientists, artists, entrepreneurs, judges, and journalists. We've recognized doctors, advocates, business leaders, and educators, historians, authors, and astronauts. Past recipients not only represent an extensive range of fields, they come from class years that span from 1909 to 1994. Many of the awardees faced challenges that paved the way for the Wellesley graduates who followed them, as well as the students of today. We have heard from awardees who during their time at Wellesley could not have imagined the accomplishments that were in their future. Today, we are honored to have with us a number of past Achievement Award recipients if you would please stand and be recognized as I call your name. I kindly ask the audience to hold your applause until I have announced all the names. Claudine Malone, class of 1963, recipient in 1991. Jean Kilburn, class of 1964, recipient in 2015. Judy Ann Rollins Bigby, class of 1973, recipient in 2007. Kwan Q. Lai, 
class of 1974, recipient in 2017. Kimberly Dozier, class of 1987, recipient in 2020. Perfect. If, this is the line. If I have missed other recipients who are joining us today, please stand so we can recognize you. Elise Jerry. You all remain an inspiration, and we are honored to have you with us today. The oak tree is an integral part of the Wellesley College tradition. The oak leaf pin that is presented to each Alumni Achievement Award recipient symbolizes the strength, quality, and durability of the college and our alumni. The acorn, also represented on the pin, reminds us of our potential to turn our time at Wellesley into a life of purpose, meaning, and positive impact. More than 160 alumni have received the esteemed pin and distinction of being an Alumni Achievement Awardee. And this evening, we are thrilled to add three more remarkable women to that list. As you can imagine, it takes an enormous amount of time and effort to select the recipients of this award. This important work is carried out by the Alumni Achievement Awards Selection Committee. The committee is charged with the daunting task of selecting from amongst Wellesley's remarkable alumni body a few individuals who have brought particular honor to themselves and to the college through demonstrated excellence in their chosen fields. Committee members meet throughout the year carefully reading thousands, and I mean thousands, of pages of information about the nominee's work and professional achievements. We extend our heartfelt thanks to the selection committee members for their dedication and care throughout the selection process, both those members who chose tonight's honorees and those who will carry on with this important work. I will introduce each of these, the committee members and ask again that you hold your applause until I finish reading the names. And for the committee members, please stand as I call your name. Cheryl Whaley, class of 1987, committee chair. Martha Cohen Barrett, class of 1989. Elizabeth Minor, class of 2003. Laura Prieto, class of 1990. Sydney Stewart, class of 2018. And C.L. Tian, class of 2010. And although not able to be with us tonight, Karen Jordan, class of 1991, and Nicole Harara, class of 2011. Please join me in thanking these dedicated <laughs> alumni volunteers for their service to the Alumni Association and to the college. Also in the audience, we are joined by the Alumni Association's Board of Directors. Could the members of the board please rise and be recognized? I am so honored to work with this amazing group of volunteer leaders. And now, to help me present tonight's awards, we are honored to have the 14th president of Wellesley College join us, President Paula Johnson. Paula? Thank you, Laura, and thank you to the selection committee. For more than a half a century, the Alumni Association has recognized the outstanding accomplishments of alumni who have brought particular honor to themselves and to Wellesley through demonstrated excellence in their chosen fields. The Alumni Achievement Award is the highest honor that the college bestows. Each year, we marvel at and celebrate the remarkable talent, drive, and dedication of the Achievement Award recipients. This year, this ceremony takes on special resonance as we welcome its return to an in-person celebration. 
No matter the path they pursue, each recipient of this award embodies the values that we seek to instill in a Wellesley education. The transformative power of curiosity, the pursuit of ideas through rigorous inquiry and critical thinking, and the capacity to connect across difference and work with others to make the world more just and equitable. This is the unique gift of a Wellesley education and a testament to the power of a liberal arts education. Many past recipients of this award are pathbreakers and change makers, leaders who overcame untold challenges and paved the way for the Wellesley graduates and other women who have followed them. They inspire today's students. By honoring these extraordinary women, we are also honoring a legacy of leadership that stretches across decades and demonstrating that Wellesley is a community where young women can explore and learn, gain confidence, resilience, and independence, and move towards making a difference in the world. In just a moment, we will present each Alumni Achievement Award but first, I'd like to turn it back over to Laura, who will introduce the Wellesley Choir. Thank you, President Johnson. And thank you for your outstanding stewardship of Wellesley College, especially through the challenges of the past two and a half years. In just a moment, we will present the 2022 Alumni Achievement Awards. But first, the Wellesley College Choir will perform Wide Open Spaces. The choir is conducted by Lisa Graham, the Evelyn Berry Director of Choral Music and Lecturer in Music here at Wellesley.
Thank you so much. It is now my privilege and great pleasure to introduce you to the recipients of the 2022 Alumni Achievement Award. Mara Prentice, class of 1980, is a nationally recognized physicist and the Mallinckrodt Professor of Physics at Harvard. Among her many achievements, Mara founded a new field in physics, atom lithography. She runs the Prentice Research Lab at Harvard, and over the course of her distinguished career, has received several teaching prizes, has been named a fellow of the American Physical Society, and supervised the work of student physicists who have gone on to make important contributions to the field and win prestigious awards for their work, including the APCUR Prize. Mara has spent her career tackling some of the world's greatest challenges, using her perspective as a scientist, and is a leading source of information on the most effective ways to conserve energy as the US and the world confront climate change. She is an advisor to the US government on energy, and much of her current research focuses on DNA and the principles of self-assembly, specifically proteins that play a role in DNA recombination and repair. At Wellesley, Mara honed her problem-solving skills and ability to work across disciplines as a triple major, a triple major, in mathematics, physics, and philosophy. She holds a PhD in physics from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. In 1995, just four years after Mara started teaching at Harvard, she was awarded tenure from the physics department, becoming only the second woman to have done so. Over the course of her career, she has sought out seemingly unsolvable problems, and while she frequently works on the most difficult issues facing society and the planet, she describes herself as a fundamentally optimistic person. In her book, Energy Revolution, The Physics and the Promise of Efficient Technology, published in 2015, Mara makes the case that the world is capable of an energy revolution to stave off climate change, but that it will take courage and motivation to do so. In her work, Mara has argued that wind and solar power alone could generate 100% of the United States' average total energy demand now, and that energy changes don't have to sacrifice people's quality of life, emphasizing that the key to encouraging change on a broader scale and within a scientific framework is by finding things that fit into the culture people already have, rather than ordering them to change their culture. In October 2020, Mara was instrumental in demonstrating that the COVID-19 virus spread when airborne, working with a former student to publish a paper that examined five COVID-19 super spreader events. Her lab is currently working on a new approach to antibacterial applications of her DNA and RNA work, testing whether it's working and whether it functions better than anything commercially available. Mara places a high value on mentorship and takes a special interest in nurturing younger scientists. Mara and Paula, please join me at the podium. Mara. For your extraordinary contributions to our understanding of the physical word, world, for your ingenuity, mentorship, and drive to solve the unsolvable, for your insight into how best to encourage positive change on a broad scale, and for your desire to improve the condition of people and the planet through your scientific research and writing, Wellesley honors you.
Good afternoon. I'm delighted to be here with you and to have a chance to express my appreciation to Wellesley. Recently, I read that in our sleep, we often revisit features of our undergraduate lives because that's the time that most shapes our adult worldview. Certainly, my time at Wellesley changed me profoundly. I grew up in a suburb of Cleveland, Ohio. My family almost never traveled. Before I graduated from high school, I'd never flown on a plane, and I'd only twice seen the ocean. I'd never had Mexican food, or Asian food, or Middle Eastern food. I did not know anyone who was a professor. My world began to open during my first week at Wellesley when I was picked to play the MIT nerd in my dorm skit. <laughs> At the time, I did not know what MIT stood for or what a nerd was, but I felt very comfortable clutching my calculator during the skit. By the time that I graduated, I had developed nerd pride, and I completed my undergraduate thesis in the MIT lab where I would spend my graduate career. Wellesley offered much more than an introduction to MIT. My freshman roommate's family showed me extraordinary kindness, and they taught me many things. I learned to make stuffed grape leaves, hummus, and baba ganoush. I learned about what it's like to grow up in a country riven by civil war, and I became a fan of the Boston Red Sox. <laughs> I learned about Islam, and particularly about the diverse roles of women within Islam. I also learned about life as a professor and how to maintain some work-life balance. <laughs> Recent research has suggested that elite universities draw their faculty from a very small pool of people, many of whom had academic parents. I believe that my freshman roommate's family helped me to envision an academic career for myself and eventually to make that future. During my last two years at Wellesley, I spent a great deal of time with the international students for whom the Slater Center offered an important haven and gathering place. I discovered Mexican food and Japanese food. I even learned to write song in Sanskrit and to make a reasonable curry. I also enjoyed hanging out at Snyder Center and gazing through the big windows at the sky. But what I remember most about Schneider Center is that after my GRE exams, I spent the evening dancing with my girlfriend, and I did not receive any negative feedback from anyone, though I was and am a terrible dancer. <laughs> the sheer beauty of the campus was also a tremendous gift that I greatly enjoyed and got to rediscover today. All of my dorm rooms had stunning views of Lake Waban. As I thought out math problems, I loved to just stare at the lake, and the answer would come to me. Long walks around campus kept me connected to the natural world and provided me with perspective when I was feeling overwhelmed. Even decades after I graduated, I would return to Wellesley with my family and walk around the campus sharing its beauty. Of course, Wellesley also offered fabulous academic opportunities. I majored in physics, math, and philosophy, which I'm told has been banned since. <laughs> the first two are common combinations and easily available at MIT. But when I was in graduate school at MIT, only four out of 100 entering graduate students were women. And during my entire graduate school career, I never met a single female faculty member. In contrast, at Wellesley, all the students were women, as were most of the faculty. For a long time, women's colleges have produced a disproportionately high share of female science PhDs. Seeing oneself in one's professors makes a huge difference. In addition, Wellesley offered an outstanding philosophy program that was simply not available at MIT. A philosophy professor taught me that one in one does not always equal two since if you add a cup of sugar to a cup of water, you do not get two cups of sugar water. In philosophy, I did not do set theory and logic, which are really branches of mathematics. Instead, I read the pre-Socratics, Nietzsche, Kierkegaard, Heidegger, and Wittgenstein. Wittgenstein radically altered my vision of the world. He spoke about how humans use language to try to construct a common reality. 
and he grappled with the challenge of knowing whether we do indeed share a common reality. He wrote that what we cannot speak about, we must pass over in silence. But he also pointed out that music and visual arts are vital human endeavors that extend beyond the language of words. The world I shared with my science major friends was not quite the same world I shared with my philosophy major friends. For example, one day I was very excited that I had made a laser laze. Suddenly, coherent light appeared from nowhere. It was miraculous. I was very proud and excited that I had done it. Then I ran into one of my philosophy friends and I eagerly told her all about it. Her response was, Making a laser laze is not like discovering absolute truth. <laughs> it put perspective on things. In school and in life, it's easy to become isolated in small bubbles of like-minded people and to lose touch with the broader world of people whose experiences are extraordinarily different from our own. Majoring in physics, math, and philosophy prevented me from living in one bubble. Socially and academically, Wellesley taught me to be comfortable moving between different worldviews. It instilled in me the importance of framing scientific ideas so that they are accessible to non-scientists. I also learned to try to answer questions that people are asking me rather than simply pontificating about topics of interest to me. <laughs> Overall, my experience at Wellesley inspired me to try to be kind and to serve others to make connections between disparate worlds, and to fight to preserve the amazing natural world that is such a source of joy, comfort, and connection. Thank you so much, Mara. Laura Wheeler Murphy, class of 1976, is president of consulting firm Laura Murphy and Associates and has spent her career at the cutting edge of advo advocacy and civil rights. Laura served as the American Civil Liberties Union's legislative director in Washington for 17 years. She was the first African-American and the first woman to serve in that role. Laura hails from a family of prominent civil rights trailblazers, including her father, a judge and veteran of the ACLU. Laura was encouraged to attend Wellesley by her parents, and in particular, her mother, who was enamored with the idea of an all-women's college and deeply influenced by the achievements of her aunt, Evangeline Rachel Hall, one of the earliest African Americans to graduate from Radcliffe. When Laura visited Wellesley as a prospective student, she fell in love with the campus and decided to attend. At Wellesley, Laura honed her reputation as a smart, driven, and charismatic leader, serving as president of Ethos. It was at the college where she developed her belief that women should be presidents and leaders of influential institutions and organizations. After initially declaring her major to be political science, Laura switched to history. During her time on campus, she helped lead efforts for two professors in the Black Studies Department to be granted tenure. As she moved through her Wellesley experience, she continued to be interested in politics, and in the summer before her senior year, she interned with Congressman Perrin Mitchell, the first African-American congressman to represent Maryland. Mitchell offered Laura a job on Capitol Hill after graduation, and Laura worked for the congressman for nearly two years before discovering he was not paying his women staffers as much as the men in his office. The experience pushed Laura to seek new opportunities, and she eventually found a role as a legislative assistant in the office of Representative Shirley Chisholm, the first African-American woman to serve in Congress. Two years after she began working for the Congresswoman, the ACLU recruited her for a position 
and she left politics to work for the civil rights organization. While there, she helped propel a successful extension of the Voting Rights Act, and later relocated to Los Angeles, where she became Director of Development for the ACLU Foundation of Southern California. She was recruited by Willie Brown, California's first African-American Speaker of the California State Assembly, and became Chief of Staff in his LA office. Laura eventually returned to Washington, D.C. as Director of Tourism for the District of Columbia, then rejoined the ACLU to manage high-profile legislative and communication campaigns. Over the course of her career, Laura has received a number of commendations, including the Hubert H. Humphrey Civil and Human Rights Award. A powerful thread through all of Laura's political and civil rights work is her steadfast desire to give voice to marginalized members of society and people who cannot fight for themselves. Laura and Paula, please join me at the podium. They're even more beautiful up close than they are from a distance. Laura. <laughs> Laura, for your career-long commitment to public service and civil rights, for your work alongside some of the nation's first African-American political leaders, and for your dedication to assisting people of all backgrounds who have been marginalized. Wellesley honors you. Thank you. Thank you. I um, joined the DAR in 2003 because we have um, ancestors who signed the Declaration of Independence, and we were able to trace it through my nephew's efforts and my mother's efforts. And I was so excited to get my pin, and I found out that it was not gold. <laughs> this is real gold. <laughs> um, thank you, President Johnson, Laura Wood Cantifer, Janet McKinney, who is the troublemaker in the group, who does all the work, um, the Alumni Association Achievement Award Committee, and all of you. Thanks to my friends and family in the audience, some of whom have traveled hundreds of miles to be here. Lulu Chow Wang and Mara Prentice, you have my heartfelt congratulations as I also celebrate your remarkable achievements. This is a deeply moving honor. Wellesley epitomizes outstanding women, intellectual excellence, and stature born of stubborn endurance. <laughs> My time at Wellesley shaped me in potent ways. Having skipped the 12th grade, I entered Wellesley in 1972 at age 16. It was an era not unlike the George Floyd awakening when political upheaval was happening across the nation. I felt it calling me but I knew that I needed a world-class education to fight injustice. My first two years at Wellesley were exciting. I went to student government meetings and joined the Black Students Association ethos. Friends brought me along on road trips to hang out with kids at other colleges, but I neglected my studies. What saved me was a warning from the dean who told me to focus on academics or risk being asked to leave the school. Having been an A student for most of my life, I was mortified. The second semester of my sophomore year, I began to do what my parents taught me to do, work harder. But it wasn't just hard work. I also had to vanquish the doubting inner critic and ignore the voices of others who didn't believe in me. 
When I did that, my grades really got better. But the political advocate and organizer in me was stirred again in junior year when two tenured positions became available in the newly created Black Studies Department. African American students were elated to have a choice of professors and to see our history finally reflected in the course offerings. However, by November, because of budget cuts, only one tenured position was offered. Also because of budget cuts, two psychologist positions were going to be eliminated. This was a big deal. Students didn't want psychiatric treatment reported to their parents, which was the norm back then. Thus, many of, of, of us relied on the counselors. To focus on both issues, we created a diverse coalition of black, lesbian, Hispanic, Asian, and Jewish students, and some brave professors and administrators. But for a while, the administration wouldn't budge on the budget. That year, as Wellesley turned 100 years old, all of the presidents of the seven sister colleges were invited to a centennial celebration at the chapel. The coalition decided to organize a press conference on the steps of the chapel after the event. <laughs> I know, Paula Johnson's not gonna speak to me again. Um, I don't have any idea. <laughs> the next day, local TV stations in the Boston Globe reported on the student unrest at Wellesley. But it, it gets better, it gets better. Less than a week later, Wellesley announced that it would fund those two tenured positions in the Black Studies Department and restore the counselor positions. That experience taught me lessons in strategic coalition building and the art of tenacious but respectful, and I want to emphasize, respectful advocacy. Soon thereafter, I was elected president of Ethos. While activism was a crucial part of my college experience, Wellesley's rigorous academics transformed how I saw the world. I majored in history with a focus on the impact of imperialism and colonization in China and Africa. I learned that religious, ethnic, and geopolitical dominance and disempowerment extended far beyond US borders. Instead of seeing the world in black and white, I began to see it in technicolor. This larger aperture cultivated at Wellesley informed the rest of my life. What came after graduation was 46 years of work that included some very tough personal and political battles. Thank goodness I had a Wellesley education to help me through all of this. Powerful men attempted at every turn to talk at me, over me, down to me, and around me. Sexual harassment was ubiquitous. Having my patriotism questioned because I fought for civil liberties in the aftermath of the tragic attacks during 9-11. Being called soft on crime by the Clinton White House because of my criticism of mass incarceration embodied in the crime bill of 1994. Being criticized for my civil rights audit of Facebook because I wanted to do more to protect marginalized communities online. I found that the stubborn endurance that enabled me to graduate and prevail at Wellesley put steel in my spine during my career. And the history courses I took gave me perspective and helped me persist. And I also found a reservoir of strength in the sisterhood that I experienced on this campus. As students, we studied hard, but we also laughed. We played cards, we played sports, and we danced. And you know something? Throughout my career, I discovered that most powerful women protect their joy as much as their fierceness. When I was a legislative assistant to Congresswoman Shirley Chisholm, I experienced her infectious giggle, watched her ladylike flirting, with men and saw her cut the rug with a mean cha-cha, even as she powerfully pushed her legislative agenda. I remember being in a small meeting with former Secretary of State and distinguished Wellesley alum Hillary Clinton on the challenges of getting a women's rights treaty ratified. She regaled us with a story about her encounter with a powerful but very sexist foreign leader 
and explain how she quickly disarmed him with her wit. We laughed so hard in that meeting that our stomachs hurt. And then we got back to business. So, we must marshal all of our skills, everything, our leadership, our intellect, our integrity, our feminine power, even our humor, if we're going to impact the very serious issues we face. We are in especially dangerous times now. The Supreme Court and state legislatures are cutting off our reproductive rights in ways we could have never imagined a few years ago. The reality of climate change is bearing down on us. The war in Ukraine and a nuclear threat is lurking. All over the world, homelessness and refugee crises abound. Most urgently, our democracy is imperiled by people who would deny us our vote or refuse to acknowledge the outcome of elections or use violence like that which took place on January 6th at our nation's capital. By the way, there's a major election in, in, in less than three weeks, and I hope that you're voting and asking everyone you know to do the same, especially in Georgia. Um, it's urgent that we use our women power to confront these existential threats, and we need student leaders like the Wellesley students here, educated and ready for battle. This awesome Wellesley education continues to produce remarkable women, and I hope it inspires us to solve our national and global challenges. So, let's get to it. The time is now. Thank you, Wellesley College, for a terrific education and for this honor of a lifetime. Congratulations, Laura. Lulu Chao Wang, class of 1966, is a pioneer in the financial world who is widely recognized for changing the landscape of Wall Street and a leader in women's philanthropy. She has led an illustrious career in finance that culminated in the launch of Tupelo Capital Management, her own investment firm, which she established in 1998 to manage assets for institutional and private clients. Throughout her multi-decade career as an investor, she broke barriers and encouraged many more women to come through the doors she opened. The values that would make Lulu so successful in the financial world were instilled in her at an early age. She was raised as one of four girls in a family of strong-minded women and within a strong Chinese-American community. Lulu's father was a Chinese nationalist leader who came to the U.S. in 1948 with most of her family when she was just four. Going to Wellesley was a financial challenge for her family, but Lulu's mother advocated for her to attend. While at Wellesley, Lulu majored in English and seized the opportunity to explore her love for science and the arts. The sense at Wellesley that students should know their purpose made a deep impression on her. After her marriage to Anthony Tony Wong, Lulu initially stayed at home, but missed the intellectual challenge she had experienced at Wellesley. She found a position as a writer in a securities firm, but soon realized how much more she enjoyed investing and began to train to become a securities analyst, subsequently earning her MBA at Columbia Business School. Lulu believed women were often natural investors, tapping into both quantitative and qualitative talents, and she advanced quickly to senior portfolio positions. She went on to hold positions at Bankers Trust and Donaldson and Lufgren and Jurnet before joining Equitable Capital Management, 
where she oversaw public equities management for a decade before becoming director and executive vice president of Jenison Associates Capital Corporation. Throughout her impressive rise on Wall Street, she remained dedicated to building the base of support for women in finance that had not been available to her in the early days of her career. In 1998, she founded Tupelo Capital Management, named after the bucolic point on Lake Wabin, deciding that the successes of Tupelo would accrue to their family foundation to support philanthropy that would allow her family to support the nonprofits to which they were so deeply committed. The beneficiaries of Lulu's philanthropy were the educational and cultural institutions that Lulu and her husband believed had deeply influenced them, and for Lulu, also those which supported women. Beyond philanthropy, Lulu is active in many of these organizations in a number of ways. She serves as trustee and vice chair of the Asia Society and is a member of the board of Columbia Business School. She is a trustee emerita of the Rockefeller University, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and Wellesley College, and director emerita of New York Public Radio. In 2000, Lulu and her husband presented Wellesley with the largest gift ever granted to a woman's college to construct a campus center. This was followed in 2015 with a similarly generous gift to Wellesley for career education. Other pioneering gifts to leadership institutions in art, science, and global policy followed. In each case, in addition to the financial support, Lulu gave her experience and counsel to advance these institutions. In all cases, women's advancement was an important objective of her gift. Lulu and Paula, please join me at the podium. Lulu, for your path-breaking career and leadership in the financial world, for your high standards, intellectual brilliance, and determination, for your service and remarkable generosity to cultural and educational institutions, including Wellesley, and for your steadfast commitment to opening doors for other women, Wellesley honors you. My heart is truly very full as I speak to you today because you are the community that has really shaped my life and helped me to set my sights in life. Thank you, all of you. All of you. Wellesley has always asked us to make a difference, to serve rather than be served, so that we thought big, beyond our own interests, toward the interests of the world we lived in, and especially toward the interests of women. This charge has emboldened us to advance the values we hold dear at Wellesley, open minds, open hearts, and open hands. Yet to do so in a world that is still closed at times to these values, we had to break barriers, to show the power of intellectual honesty and generosity. Now, our generation of women in the 60s and 70s, my generation, we had to open so many doors. And not only open doors, but also to keep them open behind us for the sisters that followed us. In my field of investments, it might have seemed very lonely to always be the first one in the door 
and then to keep it open. But it was, however, it was the intellectual excitement of discovery, well learned at Wellesley, that drove me to tirelessly search for and explore the great companies and breakthrough investments that had been a part of my career. In fact, <laughs> thank you. And to have that sense of intellectual excitement really made it almost um, not an issue that I was the only woman in the room, but knowing full well that there will be many behind me. In fact, my first job in Wall Street um, was gotten before I had my uh, master's at Columbia. And because of that, I was often thrown in with uh, primarily alpha males of the Harvard MBA variety, um, who are always very strutting and very sure of themselves. And, but I was not intimidated. I was not intimidated because I had the full confidence that Wellesley had prepared me far better than Harvard might have prepared these fellows. <laughs> and this proved to be more, not just bravado throughout my career, because I found that the values of the open mind, of collaboration, again, learned at Wellesley, served me so well in finding the great companies that some of these men often overlooked. Uh, this is a point I make often in mentoring young women and also in speaking to CEOs and their recruiting teams that women are truly natural investors. They're balanced, they're curious, and they're open-minded. And they also likely work much harder than the most of the men. So whether at Columbia Business School or um, in firms where I have worked, I'm so pleased and grateful that um, I can leave behind a much greater cohort of women than when I first arrived, and men, leaving women in leadership roles and primed to bring many more women behind them. And most importantly, for us together to create the values that we want to see in the business world. So it's more than just the intellect and the hard work we bring to the business world, but the value system that we leave behind us to improve the world of business. After uh, four decades in the investment firm, uh, business, including my own firm, Tupelo Capital Management, obviously a wealthy connection there, um, I wanted the time to engage more uh, deeply with my not-for-profit work. It's been an exciting transition. And, but surprisingly, I found that there were as many challenges in, for women in the nonprofit world as there was in the for-profit world. I found that at the very senior levels, women were not in as many leadership positions as I thought they should be. And this is a shame because it costs these institutions talent and the ability to make truly thoughtful decisions. So the answer was simple. Build a community of women on the board and among the senior staff. I found that the collective strength of women is truly remarkable. And with only very few exceptions, the enthusiasm that I helped uh, each other to women to change the culture of their boards, it worked even for the women, for the men. Very often I would um, go on a board and I found that there wasn't a strong sense of community, but I began by building it with the women and as soon as the men saw how much fun the women were having, how much <laughs> we were helping each other, the men started to warm up and they started to talk to each other. And the overall board environment became so much better and productive. So I hope that this Wellesley effect is now in place in almost all the boards that I serve on. And I believe that this effect has changed the relative influence and the ratio of women in leadership positions. It has changed the recruiting changed the programming and the curriculum, and changed the level of funding available for women, whether it's for scientists or students or artists. And we found in the, the data that uh, in graduate schools, women need financial aid more than men do. I'm not sure if it's because families put higher priority on their sons and this less money set aside for the daughters, 
but we do find that women to go to graduate schools need that financial aid. And that's something that we've really addressed in all the, the boards and in educational institutions I'm a part of. We really have um, stepped up the level of financial funding for our women students. And when they do come, we all work together and we truly become a community of women who can make a difference. So thank you, Wellesley, for inspiring us, for expecting us to make a difference. And today, as I receive the Alumni Achievement Award, I know it is the greatest honor a Wellesley woman can receive. And I'm so truly grateful. I know that every one of us here today, because we are all Wellesley women, deserve in our own way the incredible recognition that I am so honored to receive today. So I extend warmest thanks from all of us to our colleagues here. So thank you so much. For more than 50 years, we have marveled at and celebrated the enormous talent, drive, and dedication of the Achievement Award recipients. They are tremendously gifted, and what they have gone on to accomplish in their post wealthy lives is remarkable. You've heard that this afternoon. We take great pride in their success, and they inspire us to bring the same energy and purpose to our own pursuits. Thank you for joining the Alumni Association in honoring these remarkable women. Thank you again to the Wellesley College Choir and conductor Lisa Graham for sharing your talents. And jo please join me in thanking our Alumni Association staff for organizing this wonderful ceremony. I'd now like to ask you to please rise as the choir leads us in singing our alma mater. The lyrics can be found in your program. <laughs> <laughs> 